Hi viewers, welcome back to the CNT Auctioneers YouTube channel. Uh, today we are doing another one of our collector's showcases and we're delighted today to be here with Les Martin. Now many of you will recognize Les, probably who uh, exhibits a lot of the British uh, military affairs all around the uh, UK. Uh, what most of you probably have seen with Les is he always carries a really fine selection of British military headdress and badges, uh, uniform and stuff, mostly from the Victorian and Georgian era. Um, but what some of you might not realize is Les has built up a superb collection of items relating to the British Airborne Forces. And today, this is what we are going to be focusing on for you. So Les, thank you for uh, meeting us today and showing us this You're wonderful welcome. collection. Very well. Um, so Les, tell us, how did you get interested in military collecting and especially interested in the Airborne Forces items? Uh, since I was a, a, a kid, I always wanted to be a paratrooper. I, I remember the, the, the films Red Beret with Alan Ladd and um, always wanted to be a paratrooper. So when I was 15, I applied to join uh, the army and uh, we all went up to Harrogate for the weekend and I was offered a, a place in the parachute regiment should I uh, pass all the, uh, the relevant tests. And, and being my age, um, I would first need to join as a, as a junior soldier. Uh, in the junior parachute company based in, in Aldershot. So uh, a year later, I just turned 16 and uh, joined the, the company at uh, Browning Barracks. And uh, literally three, four months into training, um, I had a, an injury. And uh, rather than them kick me out, uh, and I did have the chance uh, for leaving, they let me work in the uh, parachute regiment museum which oh, wow. uh, really uh, opened my eyes to to uh, collecting and what the airborne force was 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 about from from its inception right up to 1976 when, when i was there and uh, so three months working in the museum it, it was an experience and it just got me hooked on, on the subject of, of uh, British Airborne Forces. Well, you must have seen some really great pieces. That Airborne Museum had some fabulous pieces, didn't it? Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's still going in the Imperial War Museum? It is, but it, it's... Not in the same style. I mean, I went to the, the museum at Aldershot <coughs> as well years and years ago, but I know it did move to the Imperial War Museum, didn't it? So, it did, uh, is it yeah. got the Air Assault Museum now, I believe that's, it's called? That's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, it was an old style museum it, it, it was fabulous uh, you could you could touch the items you could look at the items nowadays museums have all gone um, digital and yeah and and they're aimed at a younger generation and and, and it's it's not the same no. I, do, I do think they, they spoil museums nowadays yeah. you you need to be able to touch it know where that item has come from not yeah. just a Oh, that's interesting. It's a, a video, bike. not like a video screen and an interactive experience, but that's typical of me and you, Les. We both like the like to see the stuff and handle the pieces and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, for us, definitely, I always think you're right that we want to see the, the see the pieces, and that's really why we're doing these videos as well, collectors, so you can see what is available out on the market. Because so many people ask us, oh, how do you get these pieces? Thing. The stuff is out there. If you really want to look, you can look at auction houses, dealers, etc. The stuff is out there. So if you are interested, you can find it. And this collection proves that the stuff is out there and you can, with a little bit of hard work, yes, we all know it does take a lot of money as well, but you can find some good bits. Les, going on from that, so show me some of these pieces you've got here behind us. What, 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 what for you, what is one of the most interesting bits for you here that you've got here? Uh, initially, it was the, the the Denison smocks and my interest in, in in those started in 1976 back all those days again when the parachute regiment went from the Denison smock to the uh, disrup disruptive pattern smock which is DPM material which is awful and I was lucky to, to be at the barracks uh, for a 12 month period then when these things were being exchanged yeah so outside the stores two skips most days and different units would come in exchange their old pattern Denison smocks for the DPMs and for, for the layman they all look the same but, but for those that, that know they, they are all different then of course the, the uniforms um, you've got several uniforms here um, everything from a, a Belgian SAS fella through to, to uh, a parachute provost uh, from the um, 
China Burma India Theatre. You've got uh, a Lieutenant BD uh, and his four pocket, who actually went through the war as a, as a private soldier, was a, a lance corporal, uh, I think in 1943, and an officer went off to Palestine. The uniform Les was just talking about just a second ago here, um, so you can you can see yeah, it. Uh, th this this fellow was involved in the uh, St David's Hotel um, uh, terrorist attack, basically, um, and he, he uh, lost several friends. So there was a lot of, of uh, airborne guys stayed at that hotel and uh, uh, I think it was 100 plus people actually died in there, mostly uh, British uh, military. Right. Um, then we go off the, the, the two uniforms at the end there, uh, they're Canadian, but uh, that gentleman was in charge of the Canadian Signals um, unit throughout World War II, uh, who were all broken up and attached to the various air landing units and, and parachute units um, within the airborne forces. Uh, we go right up, or well, we start actually with, with the, the step-in smock, which was the first smock that they used. Correct. That's the smock here um, that you can see here. This was the uh, what they called the step-in smock, uh, and I believe this was really copied on the German uh, paratrooper smock. And the British um, captured one, and they developed uh, the paratrooper smock for the British airborne forces. These are really rare. And Les, remind me, where did you get such a rare piece from? I've been looking for years to find one and lo and behold one turned up in your auction oh seen to auctioneers so that's where you got to look ladies and gentlemen that's where you got to look <laughs> yeah i i had I'd genuinely been looking for years to find a, a nice one and that that turned up uh, blew me away and it was one of those things that uh, you just have to have yeah, yeah and um money shouldn't come into it but obviously it does yeah but i still wanted it so i had it you had it good that's what we <laughs> yeah. like to hear so again, as Les was saying earlier, so the development of the uh, Dennis and Smock you can see here. So you've got from the first and as you go through, there's the various different types. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got enough time today to go through all the different types of that. But again, there are very good reference works out there on uh, the Dennis and Smock. It was a very good book produced a few years back. Um, definitely collectors, if you haven't got a copy of that, it's worth definitely getting a copy if you're interested in Dennis and Smocks. Um, but again, it's, it's really nice to see. And, uh, hopefully we'll do some close-up images so you can see all the various insignia on, on the uniforms. And that's something a lot of collectors always ask us is about, you know, how do you know it's definitely the real insignia? When you've handled original examples, as you, you'll, you'll probably be testament to this, you really get a feel for it. So I really would urge collectors, if you are interested, don't just rush in and buy the first one you see. Take your time, study it, have a good look, uh, and make sure you definitely get what you want. Because unfortunately, there is a lot of reproductions on the market. So do make sure you, you, you do your homework, do your research, look at original examples if you can, whether it's be in museums or other collectors. Most collectors are always delighted to share their information with you uh, and you get a real good idea of, of what you want to be looking for in an original example. If, if you can get somebody who's been collecting for a long time, he can literally be your mentor. He, he will show you, he will advise you. If, there's, if he's got anything about him, all his knowledge will be passed to you and then that knowledge you can pass on to other people but if you haven't handled the stuff you need to and if in doubt just ask somebody ask somebody who's used to doing it used to handling it used to seeing it and they will advise you correctly yeah. there is far too much rubbish on the market to make a mistake and in some cases an expensive mistake yeah i paid for all my mistakes and i made many of them but over the years, you learn and you don't make that mistake again. And it, it, it's something that uh, yeah. I sort of that's, live this by. That's brilliant advice. So we're going to move on around the room now to show some other pieces that Les has got, um, which are really, uh, really interesting pieces. So um, let's, let's move around to, let's have a look at the British Airborne uh, helmets that you've got, because you've got a very good selection. Yes, let's do. So as we move around the room, ladies and gentlemen, um, Les has got, again, a good selection of the British airborne steel helmet um, going from the sort of uh, earlier types which is what it was known as the fiber rim helmets with the leather straps uh, then moving to the later pattern with the leather straps and then of course the later webbing straps so Les tell us a bit about some of these examples that you've got here yeah um, I haven't got the, the real early uh, p-type helmet I had one many many years ago and I've only had the opportunity to buy one 
Yeah, well, they're, they're extremely rare collectors. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it, and it makes me want to cry that I sold it for three hundred pounds <laughs> in, in, in nineteen eighty. But um, you've got several real nice helmets here. Uh, my favourite being the the Stafford's helmet in the uh, top cabinet there. Um, that was a uh, a find a, a, a find in in Oosterbeek. Um, and put in a guy's barn, which we we hear of, uh, and he gave it to a neighbour many years later. And it's been in the same collection for donkey's years and i managed to get it from um, that uh, collector stroke dealer uh, last year or the year before uh, and um, it, it is such a rare helmet being a stafford's helmet uh, and, and again m myself being from staffordshire i've always wanted one never had the opportunity We have the the, uh, the medical um, unit that, that also uh, uh, landed at uh, Arnhem and uh, they were all painted identically. They all had the same thing. Then we have one here with um, the, the qualification wings painted with a, a number 16 beneath it. I have yet to meet anyone who can tell me what this unit is. Wow. Um, it would be interesting to, to, to know, but we haven't been able to find any information on it whatsoever. So any viewers of this video that have seen one of these for, or, or do know what the designation reason is for that number 16, um, get in contact, make a, write a comment on the bottom of the uh, video and uh, we'll pass that on to Les or if Les sees it as well, we would be, be good. Thank but you. This is a, a strange one. What, what, tell us a bit about this one. Very, very unusual. Uh, uh, it was a local uh, purchase and uh, it's in RAF blue or gray uh, and it's never been repainted. There is no reason, there's, there's also nothing in any of the reference books that, that would relate to this gray painted or blue painted helmet. Um, thoughts are, was it a parachute jumping instructor's helmet um, from the RAF, uh, based up at Ringway or, or one of the other uh, jump schools ar around the place, or was it not? We, again, we don't know, but n nothing um, has been put pen to paper regarding it. Hmm. One, when I'm just looking at this uh, shelf, obviously what Les, ones Les have spoken about are fab fabulous. However, this one just draws my attention straight away. The reason for this being, I love this CD where they've got the classic camouflage netting on them. Again, nice leather strap. All right, it's not the fibre rim, the real early one, but again, it's a real good classic uh, British paratrooper or airborne forces uh, steel helmet. Again, a, a helmet that, that could have been worn um, Normandy uh, in Holland um, and it is a, a good good example of a bring back yeah. um, it uh, if I remember correctly that one, that one came out of a suitcase with, with the guys uh, bits and pieces um, wow. but when you find them with an original net that's obviously been worn yeah um, they're well worth yeah uh, well worth uh, picking up yeah we, we've had a couple in the recent years fun enough we've original I think we had one couple of sales back and there was a lot of interest in it. So collectors, when you oh, are yeah. looking for ones, yeah. I always say to all collectors, try and buy the, the, the best or try and spend the most money you possibly can as long as you can afford it. Don't get yourself into debt over it, but try and um, definitely buy the, the dearest model you can because it will always come back as a, as a best investment, the better the one you buy. I, I, I totally agree with you. Always buy the best if you're able. And, and moving on to over here, um, we're going to come back to you probably can all see that we're going to come back to this gentleman in a minute um but so tell us a bit about some of these ones so th this uh, tell us about this 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 is a, what is, is commonly called a sorbo helmet which is was a training helmet but al also used um uh, in a camouflage version of the same thing to drop uh, soe agents into uh, france and uh, occupied countries uh, but that one we, we we think with the number on the back may have been uh, based up again at one, one of the parachute training schools uh, in this country uh, and it has a, a, a number which it's, it's far too large a number to be a stick number so it, it, it would be um, someone who would have it issued there and would hand it back so it would may even be a stores number um, and nowadays you have B company and you've had it for years which is part of the parachute training side of things they have their number painted on the front this may be a similar thing, 
um, as part of the training, but the number is on the, on the reverse of the helmet. Hmm. Interesting. So again, you can actually can see there's, there's all the various types. Uh, and then coming down here, uh, I'm assuming some of these are post-World War II? The, are they... These are all, all post-World yeah, War II. Yeah, so all post-World War II. And these have become a lot more popular over the years, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a lot of collectors like these now. Where they were always, um, to pardon the pun, the sort of poor man's British Airborne helmet, I would say, you know, a lot of people um, who couldn't afford a wartime one grabbed one of these ones because it looked great on the display. These have now become very, very popular. And if you do see the opportunity to buy one at a reasonable price, I recommend you definitely grab hold of it because they're only something that's going up and up and up, um, especially as the prices of the uh, wartime examples are really, at the moment, they're really rocking up in value and price. So um, if you can get hold of uh, any of the post-war ones, there definitely would be an investment tip in my, in my opinion. You have a helmet in the middle there on, on the bottom shelf, which is, uh, has the French uh, Cross of Lorraine this one here, uh, yeah. on it, yes. Um, at the 50th anniversary, there was a French magazine um, it, it published in France with a picture of a resistance fella uh, and the commandos, paratroopers, and they had these helmets. And they'd altered the, the leather configuration in, inside on the harness uh, with less of a, of a chin strap. And, and we feel that it, that's exactly what it was used for um, by French either resistance fighters or, or uh, commandos that, that went uh, through with the Normandy landings. Uh, and quite a nice, uh, again, a nice uh, helmet. Yeah, that is, that looks really, um, like I say, with the Cross Lorraine, that's a super looking um, piece there. So yeah, no, very nice. And how did you come across that, Liz? Again, uh, bought from a, a fellow collector. Okay. Who, who'd, uh, again, found it for next to nothing. Um, going through a suitcase at, at, a, at a, uh, an auction. Um, uh, some collectors get all the luck. They do. Um, well, we said we were going to come back to this piece. So again, Les, if you can tell us a little bit about this um, glider pilot officer's battle dress, and more importantly, I'd like to show the collectors uh, this very rare item. Yeah, um, this, this gentleman uh, actually took the Staffords in to... to um, the Arnhem area and was uh, uh, flying the uh, number glider number 300 um, which was a uh, if I remember correctly was part of uh, headquarter company uh, of the of the Staffords very unusual for the rank of captain uh, to be flying uh, the gliders there were many many sergeants and, and they lieutenants. They did tend to be lower ranks didn't they yeah they did they did So tell us a little bit about this, the helmet. So, you know, for collectors who, who, who aren't aware or haven't seen one of these before, tell us a little bit about this special pattern uh, helmet here. Well, the glider pilots had their own version of a helmet. Um, you will see photographs wearing the, the, the standard uh, steel helmets, but the, the, the helmet that they needed was to be able to talk to the tow aircraft um, and to have communications with, with um, people in the back of the glider and also, as I said, the, the aircraft that was towing them. Um, hence the, the harness and the uh, microphone. Um, much, much lighter configuration, uh, made of cork and paper mache leather. And, and it's, it's, they're quite unsturdy items. So the, the moment a pilot um, had landed and got his glider down safely, that would come off yeah. and, and a, a Steel combat. helmet would be put on. That's it. Because the, the, the reason they were done, they weren't designed for combat use as opposed to these helmets. They would literally just for, like you say, for communication went once in the glider. Um, and collectors, what you need to be very careful of these with, as you can probably see from this thing, it's very, very similar to the C-type flying helmet, okay? And unfortunately, there are a number on the market which have been adopted with, the, with a C-type flying helmet, et cetera, and they've been rebuilt. You do, we have seen in the past, some of just the helmets where the C-type part has been cut out. Um, so you can still see them. Um, but again, when you're looking for one of these, just do be very, very careful. Try and get some provenance details uh, and really have a good look at it. Make sure you, you can, can't see any real alterations and stuff inside. Because um, these are extremely rare. I can't even remember the last time we had one of these come up in auction. Um, I do know we was contacted a few months back by someone in, um, from our American office who was 
looking at selling a collection of which there was one, which, um, so fingers crossed, uh, we may have, uh, keep an eye out on our website. You may so. feel one, see one coming up at some point. Um, so we'll see, but that's really interesting to see that. I mean, so, some of the key points on, on that uniform is it makes all the difference when you see a uniform and you know that the insignia was put on there at the time. There, there are so many uniforms out there, again, where, where insignia has been added late, later, and you just, there are one or two uh, things to look out for, such as the, the thread that was used, the, the, uh, the way that they were stitched, and with a lot of the printed insignia, it's just that first look. You know it's been on that uniform forever, basically. Yeah. Um, and that's something collectors, you'll start to learn over time. If Once you started, like we said earlier, once you started looking at pieces and handing and seeing items in, in good collections such as this, um, or museums, certain museums, you will get an idea of what to look for. Um, like Les said, look at the way it's stitched, look how it appears on the uniform. If you can see any other stitch marks, you know, stay, stay away, you know, really, really, look at the items that you're, you're, you're potentially buying because it's, um, it's a big investment and uh, you don't want to get it wrong. And also everyone wants to have what they, what they want it to be. You know, we all have the romance, the dream of, of trying to find the glider pilot that went into Arnhem, but just, just be careful. That's all we would say to you. Take your time, take, do your research, um, and get some, maybe some second opinions or something, um, just to make sure you are getting exactly what you want. So earlier, you might have found when we originally started this video, Les mentioned a certain person called General Browning. And um, as we come up here, we can see this little grouping relating to him. So Les, tell us a little bit about that grouping. Well, it, it's quite a, a large and, and quite an exceptional grouping. Not collected or not put together by General Browning per se, but by his personal assistant, which a lot of people might find that strange that he had a, per, a personal assistant. Uh, throughout the war. Well, th this fella um, started off I I in uh, Belfast, I think he was, as a private soldier, um, but he was very good at what he did. And uh, before General Browning kicked off with the airborne forces, th they had the dungeon party where, of course, they all get together and they were, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, all the rest of it. Well, this guy was, was his assistant from then right through till after the end of the war. Uh, so he started off as a private soldier and went up to that of a major when, when he left. Um, the, the archive covers everything f that General Browning did from the start of the airborne forces right through till he, he took the surrender of the Japanese um, in Burma. Um, as we see the group up there, you have a letter on the top right hand side from uh, Montgomery. Um, and as he said, starts it off, my dear Browning. So he was a he was a a friend. Um, they were close friends where he's uh, saying he's sorry, sorry to see him leave the European theatre and he's off to the Southeast Asia Command. The uh, pennants that you see in there, um, it was his personal assistant's job to actually put them on his vehicle, um, whichever vehicle he was in on that particular day. So uh, he ended up with them at the end of the war and, and brought them back. Um, you've got a pen there with a, a, a nice gold band on it that says that this is the pen that General Browning signed the surrender of the Japanese forces with. Now, and if you've any access to Pathé News, which um, that's a really good thing about the internet nowadays, you can find the surrender ceremony that General Browning uh, took this surrender on um, with Pathé News. And you see General Browning sat there the Japanese uh, armed forces in front, the, his secretary behind him. So General Brownie takes this pen out, which you can quite clearly see in, in the, the picture, screws the end off, puts it on the top, signs the signature, closes it, and then gives it to this gentleman. Wow. And uh, he then had the gold band put on. The, it obviously meant an awful lot to him yeah. uh, throughout his service. Uh, just just a, a, a wonderful group. We, we have the, his standard which uh, General Browning took it upon himself, I think, to have five of these made for, for all of the senior uh, airborne officers, uh, as General Urquhart, Gale, etc., etc. And this one um, was never used. It, um, there's a very famous photograph of Urquhart, uh, I think it's at the Ramstein Hotel in the doorway, where he has his flag flying above him as he's uh, had this photograph taken. But this one, 
was folded up very very nicely and put again with this gentleman's um, collection. There is another one from General Browning's uh, estate that his wife uh, Daphne de Maurier, the, the famous um, author, uh, used to cover a typewriter with. Uh, but unfortunately, that one is totally shredded. And uh, as as she used to, when she wanted to get on the old typewriter, she would whip it off, get on, throw it back on. So it was kind of uh, because it, it is satin uh, and silk. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful item. Yeah. That's interesting. What I was just going to say, with, with um, a little saying, the Pathé News uh, reel, that is so important to something like this because provenance, when you get to these sort of pieces, when especially it's anyone to anyone well known or famous people, or famous incidents, the more background information you can get, the more um, provenance is so key, uh, especially when you come to resell the item. So uh, definitely if you're looking at something with a lot of historical interest, do try and make sure you check uh, what provenance you can find with it. Yeah, paper, so. paperwork is is the key. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. being able to trace it. Great. Les has also got a huge amount of cloth insignia. Um, probably way too much to show in this video, but um, you can probably see as we've been talking about this. I'm sure collectors, you can see this good little selection of uh, British Airborne insignias, sort of the wings and the, the what they're known as the light bulb parachute qualification badge and the REF parachute qualification badges. Like I say, we can't go into the details about too much because like I said, there's so much stuff we want to show you today. Um, but collectors, all what we're showing you now, what we've shown you typically is, is very expensive stuff. However, um, British Airborne wings, you can still pick up quite reasonable, can't you? And British Airborne signature to a point. Yes, definitely. Nice things. You yeah. can build a nice collection. You haven't got to spend thousands and thousands and thousands. A nice wing would cost, can cost you anywhere from sort of 40 pounds up to a couple of hundred, uh, depending on what period, how nice it is, etc. Um, so collectors, if you are interested in, in collecting airborne stuff, please don't think that you have to spend thousands, thousands, thousands to pick up a really nice collection. You can do it still uh, on a smaller budget uh, as, you, as you go forward. Awesome. Back towards the uh, other side of the room where the uniforms are, Les just pointed out this interesting grouping, which I, to be honest, I'd missed, to be honest with you. So Les, tell us a little bit about this. It's a really interesting group. Came came up for sale several years ago at, at an, an auction house. And when I'd actually delved into it, uh, obviously the wings had got, got my interest. Um, RAF connection, yeah, okay, what was he? So then we found out he was a, a physical training instructor within the RAF who was uh, attached to the uh, flying train, uh, sorry, the parachute training school at Ringway, Manchester. Um, he did a very good job there, and next thing you know, they're offering him the chance of, of uh, becoming an officer, which he took. Uh, where he came locally uh, to Cosford, which is just just down the road to, to uh, do his training as an officer. And he was a parachute training instructor. Dur during his time at, at Manchester, he was um, pretty much in charge of training the Polish paratroopers to um, qualify as parachutists. And what they did, they offered a, gr a, a very great honor that they presented him with a Polish parachute wing, which is numbered uh, as, as they all are, the, the, the genuine ones. And there is a, a book that the, the uh, Poles have produced with the names, the unit, and the number of the wing that that person had. So in that Polish book, we have flight lieutenant, and then the number of the wing, which is in, in the case there. Well, um, quite just a, an, an interesting subject of somebody that went through the entire war and uh, into the the, uh, the late forties as an instructor, and obviously uh, did very very well um, and and performed his job to to uh, the utmost. So yeah. So, so that book you mentioned, Liz, with the numbers of the program, is that available now for people? Can collectors it, get it, hold of a copy of they that? They can, book and, and there's a, there's a number of people. I don't have one. Right. But there are a number of people out there that have copies that would be more than willing to, to um, authenticate a particular wing. That's great. Because yeah, yeah. if you can attribute a wing to a particular person or get some more information, again, it all helps with the, the story and the provenance. And, and also, like I said, we don't want to focus too much on value, but again, value it does, it does help. So. Well, I, I was at the uh, National uh, Memorial, the Arboretum, and uh, I was looking at a Polish memorial there. And I'm seeing something and it says silent and unseen and I think where have I, where have I seen that before 
and I came back and I have a Polish wing that is in again in one of the cases and when I checked out the number on the back within that book this gentleman was SOE so he never wore this wing he, he, he earned it as when he qualified as a parachutist yep. but he was one of the, the poles that parachuted back into Warsaw uh, for the uprising to, to uh, assist in the uprising uh, and unfortunately he never came back but uh, against his name in the book and his rank he was a, he was a captain um, it says silent and unseen and bank that, that just a little bit of, of um, interest in that memorial and then the wing and it all dropped in, all together, in together where it where he came from well that's so really 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 what interesting. he did as i've moved along here um my eyes caught uh, i mean i i uh, very interested in, in british cloth insignia and stuff i've always loved british cloth insignia um probably a little bit over metal badges if i'm perfectly honest with you my, my personal opinion cloth has always uh, grabbed my attention and in the bottom of this cabinet here um you've got some super pieces all to do with the uh, Gurkha parachutist. So Les, tell us a little bit about this, this little grouping. Yeah, this, this gentleman was, um, he was a diplomat, but uh, during the war, he, he joined the, uh, the Indian Airborne, uh, where he was uh, a captain in the uh, Gurkha uh, uh, parachutists, paratroopers. Mm -hmm. He was actually in charge of Operation Dracula on the ground when uh, most of the other senior officers were killed. Um, Stars and Stripes, uh, the American uh, publication, did an article on that first jump in Asia where he is actually photographed in, in the magazine itself. Um, he, he was a bit of a collector also, um, and he collected it from any of the units within the Gurkha parachute, he always collected their bits and pieces. There are several uh, patches in there which uh, have never been seen, uh, including the, the, the triangle which we have here yeah, that, with the parachute and the machine gun. Yeah, that's really, really unusual. And, and hopefully you'll be able to see this on the little cutaway we're doing with this. Um, what I always like about the stuff to do with the Far East is it's, it, the way it's made, often always made normally out there as well. And you see various forms of the quality of the way that they're, they're, they're all made and the jump wings, etc. So um, yeah, really, really uh, interesting, interesting pieces. Um, not something you see a lot of, like Les said, this is almost uh, unheard of, seen it. I've never seen another one. Um, we've had the various types of Indian paratroop wing uh, over the years, but the, the, the other pieces are really, really um, quite scarce, scarce pieces to find. They, they tended to get away with an awful lot of things in, in the airborne, um, in the Indian Airborne Division that, than they would in the British Army. Yep. Um, as you see, there's a photograph there where he's wearing a small wing on, on his uh, maroon beret. Yeah. And this is his side cap with a small wing yeah, yeah. You can uh, see attached to it as well. Yeah. Uh, and in the photograph there, he's wearing the, his, again, uh, this wing yep. uh, on his chest. Yeah. Uh, he went on later on to become a, a very successful diplomat in, in the, the, uh, the British government, uh, spending a lot of time in, in India and uh, Malaya. Yeah, really, really interesting. And as you can see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you see these cabinets, there's so many interesting things. And, um, oh, that looks very different. Les, what's this um, maroon tam <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, as you'll see, there's a, a Blackwatch um, officer's stroke warrant officer's badge on the front of it. And uh, the uh, second Blackwatch was a, a glider unit. And uh, the RSM like everybody else, had to hand in their tamashantas and, and pick up their uh, maroon berets. But the RSM refused to uh, wear the beret. Uh, and he had a tamashanta made from the beret material so he wouldn't stand out so much uh, with all the rest of his troops. But being RSM, he could do what he wants. That's the privilege of that particular rank. Wow. Um, and so he, that, he wore that to, throughout the war. So that's got to be a unique item. Absolutely. Wow, that is really, really special really really special so um oh, yeah blow my mind um obviously when we talk about the british airborne forces everyone gets uh, attached to the uh, special air service the sas uh, as you can see les has got a a real interesting grouping of stuff here to the sas and uh, obviously i believe this is all one person's grouping explain to our viewers exactly what the, the difference is with the, with the types of berries now, the particular beret on the left is, is actually a Cairo-made beret, wow. as is the badge. Yep. Um, 
again picked up in an auction house uh, but a general auction house not a, a, a military uh, specialist where it was catalogued as a soldier's hat <laughs> and bought for very very little money yep. because that auction house isn't a specialist didn't have the skill to know anything about it yep. you would never have found that in CT auctions as yep. they really know what they're talking about but this uh, literally uh, as I say is a Cairo made beret and a typical uh, beret of that period with a variation of the cap badger but a much larger one yep. to, to the standard l later war yeah hopefully type. You, you'll be able to see this collector so this is like Les was saying this is the, the, the early stuff the Cairo made stuff in that always a particular or a different style of look for to the badges and and again once you experience and you've had a look at a few pieces and seen you will start to see the differences between the the Cairo made stuff or the theater made stuff to then the more later type stuff so you can see in this cabinet you've got a whole mixture of the various types of SAS jump wings and berry badges etc um, so have a good look when you're looking for this stuff because what collectors most collectors really want is the um, unusual or the early Cairo made stuff that's the stuff that really at the moment is, is really hitting the market but but anything to do with the SAS is always very very popular being wartime or post-war um, just quickly this looks a bit interesting what's what's this uh, piece here this piece of embroidery it's actually a tea cozy right okay um, well the SAS must have liked their tea as well yeah, the, the, there is an, an ongoing joke with, with, with a number of, of uh, veterans who uh, I'm friends with, and, and we said it was from T Squadron, and, right. and, and, and there never was obviously a squadron called T Squadron, um, but it's so large, it, we, we said it was a cold weather hat for, for the Arctic, stick on the old head there, and it, it would fit quite well, but the embroidery on it is superb. It is, it's beautiful. And, and, and obviously, uh, belonging to a veteran who served throughout Africa, 41 onwards. So he would have highly likely been, been uh, L detachment and finished up um, perhaps in one, one SAS or two SAS. Uh, on the other side, you have the full size regimental cap badge and the other areas of Germany, France, and, and the, the areas where uh, yeah. he may have, d have done operations. Yeah. But again, a, a, a beautiful item. And the embroidery, you can see the embroidery of the wing and the, and the parachute. That is almost identical to the embroidery you find on the on the actual jump wings, isn't it? Absolutely. As well. so, yeah, it's, it's probably made possibly by the same person who would have made the jump wings. Maybe it, it, it would have probably been made by people who would have made uh, yeah. such as this wing yeah. and, and uh, berry badge. Now th these were either done in Italy or uh, in 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 the field. They yeah. they certainly weren't done in the UK. We yeah. had a standard wing, which is that example. Yeah. Um, now that is a, a 44 SAS uh, jump wing on, on its um, sealed pattern card. On its sealed pattern yep. card, and, and if you look at the back of that card, it's everyone who has ever taken that out to make wings yep. have had to put their details in and what the unit was. So that card was used right up until the, the uh, early 1970s, and the last people to sign that card out. Um, from from the unit was it yeah yeah, yeah. The... Um, uh, literally was the New Zealand SAS wow and, okay. and and they used that pattern which is the wartime 1944 pattern uh, wing and they still wear it today right okay yeah that's really really interesting there's a really nice group of stuff there so um, as we've gone round Leslie's collection here there's so many things um, to look at and so many great items um, one thing that Particularly, I would say one of my favorite pieces is over here, and it's this shoulder title uh, right here, um, 52nd. Yeah. 52nd. Les, tell us about this one. Well, it, it's again, it's an unofficial title, which a lot of these titles were. Um, and the 52nd is the Oxford Oxen Books, yep. which um, finding these, you will, you will occasionally come across them, but they are very, very rare they a, are. again. But uh, yeah, we've only had a few of them through our hands um, through the auction house. But when we do, they're very, very popular. And Leslie's probably going to tell us why they're so popular. Again, it's a, it's a wonderful design. It's a lovely design, typical early war British manufacturer, which today you can't, you cannot, the fakes, you can't make that mistake. You see a real one, you see a fake one. There is, it's chalk and cheese. There's, there's so many differences. But 
seeing them like that in, in untouched condition, a guy may have been given a half a dozen of these to put on his uniform or whatever. Uh, but when they changed the rules, no, they went back to printed oxen books, which was acceptable. But there were one or two people who still went through the entire war wearing them. Yep. Uh, you don't see them very often, but no. they are. They are very, very nice. And of course, the Ox and Bucks, famous for uh, their, norm their involvement in the Normandy landing. Um, and again, there is pictures, I believe, of is it Major Howard was wearing he was. one of those. Yeah. And um, so there's, there's lots of pictures of the, of the guys who first dropped into or went, uh, sort of Pegasus, Pegasus, Pegasus Bridge, Bridge yeah. the, uh, the guy at Air Landing, wearing these 50 seconds. So when you find these titles, they are really, really sought after. Um, I've had a few in my own personal time collection over the years, and uh, sold them and always regretted selling them. Luckily, I do know who still got them. One of them you sold to me. Oh, there we go. I do know who still got <laughs> one. Les still had one. So probably ten, still... 10 years ago, I should think. I would think so, yeah. Just pre uh, CNT auctioneers starting. Um, but yeah, and I know where the other one is as well now. So yeah, so it's um, really good, really interesting to find. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. We've had a really uh, good time speaking with Les and showing us stuff. There is so many things uh, on display here. Um, that we can see, unfortunately, we don't have time to show every single thing, but there is one piece of good news. Les has decided it may be time to sell this collection. Now, Les is offering this collection for sale as a whole lump, I believe, uh, I, currently. I would he would be preferred for it to sell as a whole lump. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then he may look at selling some things individually. If you are interested in possibly purchasing this whole collection, or you are interested in acquiring certain pieces that are on display here. If you are an airborne collector, there's so many good things here. We really couldn't blame you for wanting to buy some of these pieces. You can either do one of two things. You can get in contact with Les directly if you know his details, or if you would like to, you can come through us here at CNT Auctioneers and Valuers, and we will certainly put you in contact with Les Martin, and you can speak to him about individual pieces. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this video. Les, thank you thank so you much Mike. for taking the time to show us. I really enjoyed it. And if you have liked this video, please do like the video and subscribe to our channel. We will be trying to do a lot more of these collector showcase videos. So if you've got a collection out there you would like to show us, like to share with all our viewers, please do get in contact. We'd be privileged to come and see you. And it doesn't have to be a big collection like this. It can be a smaller collection, single pieces, any you've got, you'd love to see us. We'd love to see the items. This is all about showing what is out there, collectors. And this is what you can achieve. Really great. Hope you've enjoyed it. And once again, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.